The team was in New York, or yeah, in the city, and I was not on that TDY, so I was home. I was at uh, regular duty day for me Monday morning. Um, so I decided to go out to the range. We're trying to do this pro shoot thing every morning instead of PT time. You go out early and just get some trigger time. So that's what I was doing with uh, one other guy and then our Cadams guy. And I got a text message from Major Bogle when we were out there before, as we're starting to do range setup. So pretty early in the day, around like eight o'clock, I think is when he started texting me, asking me if I was around or if I was available. Um, or if, if, I mean, he was, it's pretty cryptic, uh, but eventually he called me and then he told me what was going on. Uh, we didn't end up breaking down much. We just started taking down targets and stuff at the range and beating feet back to the unit. Uh, we were at the local PD range, which was close, so we were uh, literally five minutes away. Came back to the squadron and got caught up on what was going on. Um, realized since, since we were so short man that um, I was the team leader and Major Bogle was my team commander or mission commander, and which turned out I was the mission leader and he was the mission commander for, for the initial stages and then throughout the whole mission. Yeah. It seems to me you guys seem pretty close. Like, you know, obviously everybody works together and there's a, that level of camaraderie, but apart from that, it seems like a lot of the guys are friends in addition yeah. to that and spend time maybe off the job, whatever. But obviously there's, there's just a different level of um, understanding and, and teamwork that might exist in maybe other organizations uh, just because of the nature of what you do. So on that right away, you guys were like, say, the first two kind of building that team. Uh, how, how did the decision process go um, putting together the rest of the team? I'm guessing maybe uh, Major Vieira was also uh, in on it at that point as well. Uh, Major Vieira wasn't so much in on most of the the mission planning. He kind to he, he so initially we were looking at who we had available. Um, like I had mentioned before, a lot of guys were in the city already doing training. There was a couple guys that were already on separate TUIs, other parts of the United States. Um, but then you just go down a, li a list of names you think you could potentially recall and see who could get there in the fastest time. Uh, number one was to bring on um, well maybe maybe. Captain, or Major Vieira came first, but I think it was Blom that was initially brought to our attention. We, did, Me and Major Bobo were in the office together, in Major Bobo's office, talking about what our team complement could be, who was available. I knew I had three guys, very new three levels, that were at the unit. Some were, weren't even MQT'd, were mission qualified at that point, um, two of them, and one was still, was just qualified uh, recently. So we had uh, fairly few to pick from that were right around the squadron. Um, and so we started looking at who else could add on to that list of names we already had. And then um, Blom's name came up, um, Vieira's name came up, and uh, then we started exploring who was within proximity, whether it was an hour or an hour and a half being those guys at Randall's Island. So that all happened really fast and quick. The, I kind of took the team compliment. Um, and Major Bogle took developing the mission and gathering the information from the, getting a hold of the RCCs. Um, and then one of the other point of contacts for us was Doc Rush, who <laughs> heard about the mission through the med group, I believe, and then ended up sending out a mass text, is this real? And then I called him as soon as I got that because it was like a light bulb went on. Yeah, I got to contact Doc Rush, let him know what's going on, and he can help facilitate the, uh, the med pack out and also what he ended up doing was getting a hold of the RCC and advocating for us for this mission. I think that's an interesting piece of it that Doc Rush actually played a pretty critical role. Crucial, yeah. And not only that but also in just even uh, tapping uh, resources and relationships he had in oh, the yeah. community to get some of those. Uh, yeah, lactated ringers. So for the amount, of, the amount that we needed for this mission, um, it's not, it, we have, uh, MOAs for these types of things. It's not uncommon for a unit not to have that amount because it's just you're not you're not supposed to carry that much. You know? What's an MOA for somebody that might not? So know? it's it's a like an understanding of use, um, like military. To be honest, I'd be guessing if I went up with. But the idea is, it's like you know, for your regular agreement. use, military official agreement. I think is what it's called. 
um, versus an MOU, which is of use. So if you were to go to the pool, like say we do our pass test at a pool, we have a, an agreement for use. If we, ha if we have an MOA for what we did as these hospitals, then we can get medical equipment. So great to have somebody at that level yeah. of a medical mind and then how dialed in he is in the medical community just in terms of geography here, yeah. and then his level of experience to be able to help advocate oh, for yeah. the mission. It's just, just connections. Doc Rush is the, the man with the connections in that community, especially the medical community. Any, everybody at the squadron goes to Doc Rush for anything, anybody. He knows everybody out. And it's not just knowing someone at the bottom. Doc Rush knows the top. He knows, and he's got, he's got a name that everybody else recognizes too, so he can get stuff done. I think that's something else that um, most people maybe don't understand is, there, there is some aspect of had we not built these relationships earlier on with, say, the Boston RCC Rescue Coordination Center mm -hmm. and some other folks and letting them understand clearly our capabilities, we might not have been in the discussion of who could best handle this call. Mm -hmm. And I think that through Doc Rush, Major Bogle advocating, that's what actually steered them away from uh, the Canadian search and rescue or the Canadian vessel that had some limited uh, medical capability versus what we could provide. And I think winning the mission boiled down to a matter of uh, timing and who can get there the quickest with the highest level of medical skill set. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm fairly new to Gabreski itself, but not new to the community. And PJs have, PJs have been laying their name throughout uh, the world for a good period of time and well-respected. Um, and essentially what you just touched on is huge here in this local community because it's gone from chains of command before it even started with Macaulay from what I've understood is that this, the relationship building is crucial to this career field because when these things happen they kick off real fast and they can either pass you by or you can reach out and grab them and these guys certainly reached out and grabbed this one. Do you find in your experience prior to coming to the 106 that did you know who the 106 was? Did, did they have a reputation within the power rescue community? Is there a reputation for medicine or access or anything like that? So Doc Rush definitely carries the reputation for this squadron. He's the medical coordinator for all the, com the community, whether it's active duty or guard or reserve. So when you think New York, you think Doc Rush, as well as New York just being in a prime location. Uh, you think Perfect Storm, you think the heritage behind the squadron. Not even just the squadron, but yeah, the wing itself. Um, so those are the two big things that would stand out to a PJ if you asked anybody, um, aside from knowing this area. So that's interesting. So yourself, you're originally from Maine, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that is part of the consideration, the idea of like, hey, this, this unit is probably in closest proximity to the New York City in the event something bad were to go down in the future. That's also, uh, is that part of it? Uh, the allure to get it to become part of this team and in, in the sense of response or it's definitely a location a lot of the guys here are local um, a lot of the guys didn't have grown up in the area uh, there's that spinoff for this the beach the lifeguard guys the three of them on this mission in fact but um, yeah a lot of guys grow up in this community whether it's New York in general or even uh, locally around this East End here but for the most part any unit uh, in the Garter Reserve is all about the location and New York has got a prime location, being close to the city for guys who want to do school because the other half of this job is the part-timers, and they do school, and they got Ivy League schools sprinkled throughout New York City. Uh, and then you have, uh, even in the local area, guys that pick up fire department gigs or they go to the police department. And you can still get the same, you can scratch the same itch that most of the guys came into the career field for uh, being in New York. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I really love yeah. it. One thing I think that's a real compliment to you, Sergeant Sinclair, is that it was Major Bogle, I think, that said it uh, best, that you were actively recruited. Like you were, and, and their understanding for this team, kind of like a known person within the power rescue community in the career field. And they thought when they heard that there was a possibility you're you know, peeling off of active duty, like, hey, let's look to really get this guy. Mm -hmm. uh, can you walk us through what that, you know, kind of validation feels like of some of the work you've done before you've gotten here and uh, what it meant to you to maybe be thought of in that regard and to become a part of this team. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's great to hear that. It feels good. 
when you when you leave active duty, well, our career field's small in general, so if you mess something up, everybody's going to hear about it. And if you have a bad personality, everybody's going to hear about it. It doesn't matter if you're going to a, uh, an active duty squadron that uh, doesn't have control of receiving you or a guard and reserve squadron which can pick their guys for active duty. Um, whether you, If you carry a bad reputation anywhere, it's, it's not good. So most of the guys you find in this career field, they pride themselves on their reputation. They, they want to exceed in all aspects. So um, I don't find myself any different than anybody else, really. But if, it definitely feels good to be the guy that um, gets talked highly of. It kind of validates, like you said, your hard work over the past, for me, nine and a half years before I got here. And um, most importantly for me, it's, it's not what people say. It's like it's the actions on that speak louder than the words, you know. And that's kind of more of a mentality for this um, caliber of operator that we hold as a, as PJs and combat rescue officers. Your actions on the objective, and, and it's like you can a, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? Well, in our career field, you shouldn't have to say anything. You should just be doing it, and someone can see how well you operate. Um, I think that's more important. Do you think, um, in terms of your experience in your career thus far, could you talk about the level of complexity of this particular mission versus others you might have been on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so traditionally, mostly, I was a product of, um, well, Afghanistan, really. I got a lot of dirt medicine in multiple deployments to Afghanistan. Um, and this mission in itself was complex because in Afghanistan, a lot of stuff's already laid in stone, whether you have Advan going out there to set up stuff for you. They do s s things that are necessary. Um, with setting up your rooms, taking care of the logistics side, how you're going to get equipment, um, taking care of like the mobility side, how you're going to get from a point A to point B, uh, receiving the main body, which is now um, the the team that gets there for the first time potentially. Um, but the bigger side of that would be the the mission. Um, it's been going on and it's circulating the rotary wing. Um, the AOR, you just jump on board, you have a plan, and everybody really knows kind of how the hospital's used to receiving these patients, there's, there's a reputation, you get passed on. Just, I mean, the three days you're there with the other team, they show you the ropes, so to speak. So this mission is unique, and any other really civil SAR mission, uh, civil search and rescue, is, is uh, the fact that you are in control of that, and no one else is spoon feeding you something like that. Um, you're able to control how, how you execute. You're able to control uh, the risk and how you're going to mitigate it. I mean, you're never really able to control the risk, but how you're going to mitigate the risk. Um, and you're able to put the pieces together so you can war game it and you, you can make it um, as easy as you want on you or in your team, or you can make it as hard as you want as you and your team. So really, the, what was successful in this mission was the pre-planning. And from there, Everything was just, uh, Doc Rush puts it well, and I, I can't really quote him, but he's it's, it's like, something favors the, the well-prepared, you know? I mean, we were definitely well-prepared for something like this. So the difference is we are able to um, prep for this. We were able to set up these relationships with RCCs prior to our, we were able to, um, give them the command here, even on Gabreski, the um, confidence in the fact that the 102nd and the 103rd can go execute this mission so they don't have to worry about it. So, Great. Yeah. Um, do you find that the level of medical exposure you have here is maybe different than you might have had at, at uh, units in the past? Is there any... Uh, difference in experience or exposure there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, it's like it's like sitting in the front of the class versus sitting in the back of the classroom. If if you're under a doc, not, if you're under Doc Rush, you're right there. You, he, he's going to control what you get. He's he's going to control exactly how you do things, and it's going to be the most up to date. Um, 
if you're somewhere where I was, I was just in Japan, and if we wanted to see Doc Rush, we we come to New York, which we have set up in the past. But um, when you're under the nose in the microscope, then yeah, you you're really fine tuned. So the medicine here is it's definitely on point, and I, I think it's owed to a lot of the hard work of the operators, uh, the logistical side of, of 103rd, and then ultimately the med director being part of the unit as well as not just a part of the career field. So, This mission is definitely, I think, in many ways, hits on a lot of the things that, like, a lot of the reasons why Power Rescue was called for this. Like, in, in my viewpoint, the two primary reasons it seems that you were the team of choice was like speed to the target mm -hmm. and then high level medical capability. Mm -hmm. um, there were other assets that were available but didn't have the, the degree of medical capability, uh, supplies, uh, manpower, and didn't have the timing to get there. Mm -hmm. And certainly the ability like you guys have to insert under any conditions in any environment. So as you are selected for this and you go through a mission like this that has so many of these components that are exact, like exact validation for what the career field was designed for, what was your takeaway after having the experience and carried out the mission and seeing like, was it a validation of like, yeah, these pieces and the concept at large works? Yeah, because it's funny because you get asked if, I mean, you get a lot of a lot of people on the outside want to know about feelings. You know, like what were you feeling? Or but the most, the the answer that most guys will give you is, well, I don't, I don't, I wasn't feeling anything because I'm so well trained. I, I was doing what I was trained to do. Um, the, the validation, it feels good to be able to go do something like that. You have guys who join this career field not for the combat side of it, but strictly to go save somebody open ocean and perform a jump mission. You have guys who literally join this job because of that. Uh, it's it's awesome, and you can kind of see it around the base. You see people that, I mean, when that first week back, you, it was guys were rejuvenated, whether it was guys who were in the squadron or guys you saw in passing just around Kabreski. The guys were, the name was out there, and it does validate the fact that we're here and we're on this map, we're in this part of prime real estate in the Hamptons, and we're still a part, we're still in the game, and we're still doing these missions, and we're 100% capable to do it, and we are here for a reason. Like, the training we do validates the fact that every guy on here is prepared, um, and when the mission drops, you never know when it's gonna be, because it could have been like this one, 10 years, 10 years later, or it could be 10 minutes from now after this camera shuts off. You don't know. So the guys have to be ready. Um, and it just goes back to training. But yeah, the funny thing about training is even that mission, real world, it was still training for the guys. Uh, you had a brand new three level on there that essentially got the best training, if you want to call it that, on a real world mission. So you're always learning something and you're always getting better. It's impressive to see as a team how you guys look after each other, and especially through the structure of rank, from the highest ranking to the lowest ranking. And to your point just a moment ago, here you had a, a very you know, junior guy mm -hmm. uh, on an, an extremely complex real world mission. Um, and it, it's impressive to see how much uh, an individual in that position is put in um, a role that is like a critical role and that oh, yeah, they perform and that you're you're even at that junior level counted on and uh selected and expected to to measure up and they they by definitely do and the senior guys are are happy to just kind of take a back step and say hey this this guy's got it let's let's let him perform mm -hmm. you have to the responsibility is huge i mean you're there you, you know, you, you don't always train, or you don't, you don't always go out as a, I know we're a rescue squadron, but the potential that you're the only operator and, and you're the only one that's there to, to know all the skills that you get signed off on, or that you're, uh, you, you advertise to these, these agencies or companies, or for this situation, the civilian population, you advertise that you can do these things. So every single one of us is 
potential or could potentially be the only guy there to do them all. Um, that every PJ and combat rescue officer, they carry that weight, and that's why the job's never done. The mission happens, and then you reconstitute, and you get ready for the next one, and you continue training and getting better. Um, you go over the lessons learned, and you talk about how you, uh, what you messed up, and there's no, there's no feelings attached to any of it. You just, you just get better, and you keep training for it. When you speak about the feelings attached, I'm guessing that you're talking about like maybe anxiety or fear, or, you know, those those types of feelings that might be associated with some of the very dangerous work that you guys do. Um, what about speaking about the feelings that might be associated on the human level of like um, connection or attachment to patients that other medical professionals can probably relate to the same as you guys can in, in terms of like nurses or doctors or physicians assistants on the outside uh, world and medical community. It, does that come into play as you guys are treating and caring for patients and then after the fact, after like the, the mission's completed, now you're back home, like, you know, the attachment and feeling of like, I wonder how those guys are doing that we were there and talking to and dealing with for, you know, hours and hours and hours and days. Um, how does that work out for you? Yeah, absolutely. So, and it's good. It's good you touched on that. Whether it was in Afghanistan, you saw a patient for 15 minutes, or or it was in this case, you saw a patient for almost two days. Um, we always try to follow up and see how that patient's doing. Um, there's been s stories, I personally don't have one where, um, but there's been stories throughout the career field where the patient has actually tracked down the member. Uh, we used to go to the hospitals and, and Bastion specifically and write in their patient log, um, write the name so that they, they knew who picked them up. We would go back after a long day um, and just do a round in the hospital and see all the patients that we dropped off. Some were there and some had gone out earlier, or, but uh, the patient side of things for us doesn't so much happen during actions on, it's afterwards, like you're talking about, following up and seeing how they're doing. Like these patients, these two patients uh, from the Tomorrow Mission, we continually, you know, we continuously get updates uh, on their condition, uh, how they're doing and in and out of surgeries and whether or not they've lost fingertips or how, like what their extent, uh, their prognosis is and when they can get extubated. Or, um, these things could constantly happen, and we just got a last update um, a couple or yesterday, two days ago. So, we are definitely trying to get that information. A lot of it, especially in this situation, uh, being multinational, and then also there's patient confidentiality that we have to kind of skirt the lines on. But everyone cares about the the work they put in, uh, and then they care about people they wouldn't be in this career field if they didn't I mean the idea that you're gonna jump out and save someone else without with complete disregard to your own life I mean, it says something right there so how could you not um, care about others and think about how their well-being is after the mission that's a, it's a really impressive piece of it all I think and the idea that like almost kind of each one of these missions that you take on each one of these people that you have had a hand and touched their life it's like that's to some degree, I would imagine an ongoing thing that you carry that with you. Like, hey, I wonder how that guy is, is doing three, five years down the road. Or, mm -hmm. And I think it's really neat the idea of going and uh, writing in the patient log and stuff like that in the hospitals. It's, yeah. And, and it, isn't there a tradition for those folks who maybe don't know about um, the whole idea of like poker chips in the, in the combat arena of like, you were saved by Pedro or that kind of stuff. Do you know yeah. anything about that? And there's a, is there a tradition that is in place here that's similar to that? Uh, so the poker trip started, um, f I was actually, first active duty station was Vegas, so you can assume that's, that's where poker trips started. They came from Vegas. Uh, they started making their way into the, um, the AOR um, area of responsibility in Afghanistan. And... Um, for each poker chip, it said, I mean, they've developed, I have some in my cage right now, but on them they'll have either a guardian angel flash or uh, the rescue angel herself or um, the helicopter 
um, saved by Pedro. But essentially what that is, yeah, it's, it's just a token of um, who pulled you out, uh, who was there for you, and if you ever needed to reach back out, you, you have someone to call, and that was kind of how it developed. And guys would go and leave them, like you're saying, yeah, absolutely, we would do our hospital rounds. Um, even on the busiest days, we would go to the hospital and check in and leave a poker chip if they were there or not and sign uh, the names in case they ever wanted to contact. And in a way, that's kind of, it's it can be used as close, closure for the patient if they really had something life-altering, like they lost a couple limbs, or it could even be closure for the operators themselves being able to go and check on them. And if at any point they needed to follow back up, if they had any questions, we'd be 100% willing to meet up and talk about it if they did later on in life. But you never know when those opportunities will present themselves. And they have, so. Is it commonplace to leave that token with someone as they're being taken off the aircraft or taken away from your care? Or sometimes like as a follow-up in the hospital a day later or something like that? So, a lot of times, uh, and personally, I can only answer for myself that I wouldn't give um, a poker chip to any just to just anybody because there's a lot of times there's people who uh, show up to the helicopter in Afghanistan specifically with like six bags and they're well packed and they could be using it as a trip to go to another fob and then there's there's patients who no kidding uh, they need you there so you know there's always. There's always ranges there, but I think it was up to the operator's judgment at that point of who um, they felt really got saved versus the ones that didn't really need saving. Is that tradition something that's more alive in like the combat arena versus peacetime in a civil SAR I environment? Think so. yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it's an interesting world we live in today in that, you know, unlike say maybe 10, 20 years ago, it's not at all hard to find people online. And I know that um, guys in the, in, the, in the rescue squadron and, and folks across the board in the wing have you know, had the opportunity to see some of these folks, uh, these two patients in particular, through like say, you know, social media presence online. Mm -hmm. um, have you had that chance to, to see any of that? And is there an impact from that? Like, cause as you've cared for these guys, obviously you're arriving and they're in a different state after the uh, event in a, in, a, in a horrific accident. Mm -hmm. And then as you see a, a social media presence, I, I guess it gives more context to who you were looking after and caring for during that time. Yeah, there's, I mean, uh, the biggest thing for us really was how just drastic they changed in appearance from uh, how they looked prior to the injury um, and then what we saw when we were presented with both patients. Um, but really when you're, you know, when you're working, it's like any other job. It's it's the job, and it's for this particular um, career field. If you're doing patient care, it's like a, it's it's almost like a machine you're trying to fix. So it's not you're not really attached to that side of it during it. Um, but after we were looking at pictures and we were just blown away at how, uh, for instance, the the 20 year old or the 22 year old just. It's night and day, um, and then uh, even the other, the forty-year-old was. Both of them just burns to the face, just swelled completely up, and you were able to see just the difference of how, how terrible their injuries were versus what they looked at before. And then, um, yeah, their lives are changed forever in terms of plastic surgery that they're undergoing in order to, to get some of that back. In your experience, have you uh, dealt with patients? Um, you know, I, obviously, as you talked about a moment ago, um, amputees and, you know, people who have faced a horrific life-changing events as a result of their injuries in an, mm -hmm. in an event, an accident. Um, and then after the fact where you've seen them, you know, thriving and doing well and, you know, you think like, well, thank God that we were there and did what we did. And, you know, life is very, very different from them, for them three to five years later, say. Yeah. Um... Well, personally, no, but I have treated, um, I've, I've treated a great deal of amputees, um, whether it was single, double, or triple, um, even one quadruple. And honestly, I, I haven't been able to track down any of that information. 
But uh, a good buddy of mine, uh, August O'Neill, I grew up with in the career field. Um, went to Vegas with him, and he was the PJ who got shot uh, through and through, uh, right leg to left leg, and he ended up having elective uh, amputation. And now, he, I mean, that that dude's perseverance. He's just if if you get if if there's any uh, injury that they sustain that is debilitating, you take it takes a strong will to just do everyday tasks, let alone August. He's, he's been fighting to run, get back on uh, status. He was one of the first PJs to get active duty status um, as, as an amputee. Uh, so he's back on active duty as an amputee? Yeah. That's fascinating. So, yeah, August O'Neill, he's one of those guys that... There's more than one. You said he was one of the first. Are there a number of... Uh, Power rescue that are actually amputees back on active duty? Yeah, there's another one out of uh, Alaska, Madama. He ended up having an amputation. He's also back on status. So, and there's multiple um, amputees back on status and other sister services. And, and back doing that job as an operator. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's impressive. So, yeah, again, it goes back to just, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, the heart that goes into something like that, the day in, the day out, it's, I, I couldn't imagine. But I'm sure, I'm sure everybody has has that down deep downside. But that really all all it takes. And these guys are these guys that dig it out and really go down and fight for every day. It's something that inspires you. Yeah, and I can only hope and imagine it would be the same for these two men. As you see, the social media presence, there's definitely like a love of life with the younger guy. And I think that that kind of resilience you can only hope will carry through in whatever his. Uh, medical forecast is moving forward and that, you know, as he rebuilds his life and, you know, God willing, things uh, go as best as they possibly can and who yeah. knows what the future holds. So. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find um, that once this mission was completed, looking back on it, it it's, I, I would imagine, probably one of the more complex of your career. And do you feel like that you will, will take things away from this um, for future missions or to impart to other guys in the team. And how does that work? Or how does that look when you're there kind of sharing um, experiences to, to team members? Yeah, so um, every mission is going to be different. Um, but the more exposure you have to things like this, then and essentially that's what experience is. So it's just the more that you can share those experiences, whether it's from the training that you're able to implement or um, the recommendations um, all the way from gear to how you can potentially do big picture rescue and you're going to have to share that information which we do um, but it definitely it definitely helps to have experience in a squadron which uh, the 103 is lucky to have yeah bef even before this mission there's a wealth of experience and um, you just have to, you have to train as if it's going to happen the next day, whether it's active duty, um, guard reserve, uh, whether it's deployment, uh, so in a combat zone, or it's not. You still have to train the same because you're going to be asked to do it uh, at some point. So It seemed like there was um, this idea from some of the other guys I talked to of like that you uh, seven in particular on this mission, you know, ha had this experience of this in incredible mission and, you know, so many of the pieces just fell into place and much of that was due to preparation and being prepared and mm -hmm. from the 102nd and the, and the, the aircraft and the, the guys in the 130, the bundles coming out, uh, getting 300 feet off the deck to throw the stuff out. Everything just seemed like it just clicked along with, precision and um, went according to plan. Now, it seemed like there was something in the, in the, within the team of like, as the next opportunity arises, there, there would be the inclination to try to like select folks who have not, you know, had the chance to get on something like that, you know, to kind of uh, pass it along and pass that experience to other folks who are, you know, like I'm not hogging the mission kind of sense. Uh, what's behind that, and can you talk a little bit about that? And do you see that within your group, it's a it's a pretty large group, that that's the way things uh, work 
naturally or obviously it's who's who's ever the best fit at the time and who's there yeah so i mean um if we're gonna yeah talking about it's, it's gonna be targeted opportunity for most of for most of the mission sets that we get dropped here um but if it does come down to a full house then you are going to try and, sh and, sh and sh share the wealth so to speak because you don't want to be um the guy who's taking all these missions. You don't want to be um, the guy who's teaching just from um, your experiences. You should be able to teach from other people's experiences um, or be taught too. So there's things that can definitely be learned from other people taking the missions and also putting yourself in a different role, um, whether it's helping pack out uh, for a mission set, and you're just as vital to the team, or if you were on the on the mission. But um, the tough thing that's going to be hard to skin here is an alert. I mean, it's not it's not a typical alert. Like um, we've seen, or I have, and a few of us at the squadron have been active duty, where you are on an alert schedule. You're 100% on an alert schedule, and there is a name, a list of a team that comes out. Uh, for that week and who's on call and who is what position and then and anything drops and those are the names get, that get called and then next week it's and it's all back to an availability thing who's going to be around and then when you're on alert you're on alert you're not going out and you're not you're not um, I mean because one of the things that we do is, is you fly and you can't be drinking if you're flying you can't be um, away from the local area if you're supposed to be on alert schedule. So an alert is kind of a touchy subject. It's not as easy as as uh, people think, really. It's something that you need to be all in for, because if you're on alert, then you got to be ready to take this phone call at any point. So the 103rd uh, is slowly getting to the point to where we're going to be responsible for most most of the calls that come in, and we'll be ready to posture towards that, but um, I don't think it's been put out that we're ready for the uh, alert schedule. But when you talk about that, that's when you kind of get into teams and responsibility and sharing missions. Would that be an actual change in, in designation or procedure for just your, just the 103rd, just that squadron, versus like obviously the whole base is not on alert, so that would be like a different thing. So is it, like what you're talking about, would that be something that would have to say, hey, we would, uh, there would be some change in status that would then allow us the capability to staff to that and posture to that scenario? I don't think so. I think it's just an advertisement. Um, and it's all about, I mean, it's all about what the leadership's intent is. And right now, we're number one intent is to be able to to get anyone anywhere, anytime, whether it's in combat or local. So the 103rd stands ready to go uh, to receive any phone calls currently. Um, from there, I mean, we still need to figure out a way to get to the objective area. And it, we were, like you said, things aligned to where we were able to jump on the 102nd bird that was ready to go with the crew that was staffed and the, uh, the plane that was up and up. Um, so we're slowly trying to figure out the best way to, in order to work around the alert posture. It really is what we're talking about. Because um, to posture for alert, it's a, it's a big, big uh, task. As is right now, are there um, team members that are there 24-7? Uh, is that area manned 24 hours or not at this moment? Uh, not officially. Understood. No, not officially. Do you think it was it really nice on this mission, I think in particular to to have the direct support from leadership from the like the wing commander on down were all in on you know you guys taking this mission yeah, absolutely uh we couldn't have done it without that support um I mean we were in any mission you ask for the world and you get what you get, and we were able to get pretty much everything we asked for, so it worked out that I guess has also been a a byproduct of the way you guys have been doing business in, in terms of like bringing more people into the fold and having more exposure to who you are, what you do, what your capabilities are, and getting
getting that trust and confidence from leadership that, you know, you're taking uh, measured risks. This is not like cowboying things like, you know, and understand, you know, safety first mentality, but like, here's our operational limits. We can definitely do these things and, and carry it out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you think was your first kind of feeling uh, after this was all wrapped and you guys made landfall? And I think for you folks that got off the boat, it was a little bit hairy getting oh, yeah. off the boat. Yeah. But um, once that was all done and you kind of reunited with the rest of the team that uh, followed on in the helicopter for the two and a half hour ride back to the Azores, what were some of your initial um, uh, reactions as you got back together again with the 130 guys as everybody kind of collected together back as a team? Yeah, it was definitely, so uh, we kind of all decompressed at different times. The team that went back on the helicopter had a couple days to probably talk amongst themselves, and it was definitely uh, a feeling of relief. Um, and then the, even on the boat, the four of us, we were, there was a sense of relief. You could, it, we did our job, and everybody was happy to have done their job, and um, so the four of us talked about it amongst each other. I'm sure the three of them were able to talk about it amongst themselves. And then two days later, we were able to come together. Um, but at that point, it was like, dudes were just ready to go home. It was, uh, that was the longest Monday, I think, for anybody. And <laughs> um, more people were just, it was good to be back together as a team. Um, handshakes and hugs and good jobs were passed around. And it was, you guys were, I think, focused on on getting home because the, the real thing now is just trying to link back up with family and um, get back safely. On that note, you're you're married. Do you have children? I got two. Yeah. So, what was that Monday morning like for you? Like leaving out to work? Like you said, you start on the range. It's like have breakfast with your family. Kids yeah. go off to school type of deal. Mm -hmm. Give the wife a kiss goodbye. Kids get. So, what was the like? Paint that picture for me. In the St. Clair household, Monday yeah. morning before you shoved off, like kind of. Well, thing. I wish my morning was that picture perfect, kissing <laughs> the wife and the kids' <laughs> breakfast. But really, I wake up before everybody in the house, and I'm usually the one that's waking people up, cooking the breakfast, and uh, I try to try to get out the door. Um, but yeah, they just thought it was a regular Monday. Um, but I was able to uh, call prior to stepping to the aircraft and let them know, or let my wife know um, that I had a mission and. She's familiar with this, having been through this uh, this game before, so I was able to tell her, and uh, told her I'd call her when I called her. I don't know how long it's going to be, probably a couple of days, and uh, it turned out to be five days. But um, yeah, it's it's funny getting back and kids asking me, "Well, how was the boat, Daddy?" And it was like it's, it's easy to talk to them, you know. Uh, but one of the big do outs before we left was um, you got to take care of the families and the unit are, did a great job taking care of the families. One of my requests was that they update everybody and call and, call and let families know what we were doing to, the, to their best ability and keep everybody on track because, um, yeah, they're, more than 50% of that operator is their family. Because, um, they put in just as much as that guy who went on that mission so they need to they need to be given that um, information and I think that makes it easier coming home to being kept in the loop which they were so a like, huge kudos to the squad and I guess that's very different in a civil search and rescue uh, mission versus obviously combat as yeah. different securities and other concerns so here they were very much able to keep posted on the the, the the conditions as they unfolded pretty immediately and kind of know what's going on. Hey, everybody's safe. Everybody's on yep. the boat. They're on the boat safe because, I mean, your family knows by now that a jump mission or a jump is always risky or, you know, it's, if they're on the boat safe and just giving them updates as to what's going on. They're on the boat safe. Uh, they, they may be uh, looking to be land, make land at this date or should be home by this date. and just keeping updates, but yeah. After living through this experience and, and seeing all that went on with these two gentlemen and then understanding and, and knowing a little bit of, you know, maybe not even as much at that time, but for some of the guys, yes, that were in the uh, helicopter, you know, having their personal effects and unzipping the bag and seeing 
what belongs to who. That was like their first chance to see a, a photograph of these guys and you know before the accident. Um, do you think having gone through that whole thing, and I'm sure it, it has to have uh, an impact as a person, as a father, as a husband, do you feel like when you are reunited back with your family that you know you hug your kids a little tighter and that that kind of idea that you know you hear sometimes uh yeah yeah yes and no i think the biggest thing is you just appreciate the time you have with with family um because time's one of those things you can't get back so when you're done and you just want to be done if the mission's over you just want to be left alone and and focus on your family. That's really it. Uh, that, because again, yeah, it's it's all about spending time with your family. When you're at work, you're at work, and your family knows you're at work because you you are in this career field that gives 100 percent, 110 percent of you um, when you're at work. But then you gotta also know when to turn it off too. So uh, some guys have to be told to turn it off and leave work, and then some guys. Some guys know already that, again, time is the most valuable thing, and you need to spend time with family because your time, uh, on any Monday, you could be gone for a week. Make that separation, yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been, I think, really, really good. I really appreciate you taking the time. Is there anything that I might have missed that you would like to add? Um, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. It was an excellent mission, and um, I just, yeah, I, I think that we didn't do everything perfect, um, but we, at the end of the day, we did, we did right by those patients, and we were able to get them, get them to uh, higher level care, and they're still alive. So there's definitely a couple saves under the 103rd belt um, added to the chalkboard, I think.